Any Squared Spotlight Art Talks highlight member and friend artists of all ages and experiences. audience member. Um, so welcome to Any Squared Spotlight, where we highlight artists of all kinds of experiences and ages. Um, today we have a treat. We have um, B-Boy B here with us, um, who my friend called Hip Hop, uh, hip -hop Royalty, and, um, and also a legendary graffiti artist and you know the founder one of the founders of flypaper the writers bench and abc artistic bombing crew there's so much to talk about and i'm going to let b-boy b say his own words and i'm very excited to have you on the talk thank you for a good introduction <laughs> <laughs> um yeah i'm uh, b-boy b i'm uh, Chicago uh, graffiti writer, and among other things, um, I do a lot of stuff in Chicago. Um, so yeah, um, since this is more of, a, of an art talk, I'll, I'll try to stick to art, um, but I do a lot of other stuff. Um, so I don't know, should I just, just get going into the slideshow? You can get going into the slideshow. I mean, okay. I would like to hear a little bit about why yeah. you became an artist <clears throat> well, for, for the the youth in the back why i became an artist well i think everybody's born an artist yeah um, i think everybody's an artist i think that as you grow older from being a child you become um steered away from art from the uh, adults in the area, uh, parents, teachers, cops, shop owners, whatever. And they don't see that if you're not like in their eyes an, an artistic genius, they would they kind of want to steer you into a different direction so that they can feel better about when you grow up that you can sustain yourself i think but the reality is that everybody's an artist and i think it's it's tough to be an artist and make a living um i i certainly have made a living from from my artistic uh, sensibility i've always been in des the design world video and photography uh just visual um and i made a living from from that aspect uh, of art. Some of it commercial art, but still art. So yeah, I just became an artist, I guess, because I never stopped. Because I never listened to adults, basically. I never, <laughs> never listened to them when they told me, don't do that, it's not art. Um, so I kind of had my own little uh, hard-headedness about, about art. Um, so yeah, that's that's kind of why I stayed an artist, and you know, developed myself as as an artist. Um, I could have, you know, taken many many roads. Um, you know, I could have become a fine artist. I could have done more commercial stuff, uh, but I stayed somewhere in between. So that's that's who I am. So I make a I make a living from commercial art. And I still have my own art that very rarely gets paid. <laughs> <laughs> so what kind of commercial art are you doing? Like design work? <clears throat> I did a lot paying? of design work for a ton of advertising agencies. So I worked for the big agencies here in Chicago, um, Leo Burnett, uh, their Spanish version of Leo Burnett called Lapis, which is mm -hmm. pencil in Spanish. 
Um, uh, I worked at YNR, Young and Ruby Can, another big firm, ad firm. Um, you know, I worked at BBDO. Um, I worked at a bunch of other fancy, yeah, small <laughs> type of agencies. Um, but anybody in that world knows that you're very that world is very high paced and has high burnout. So I did, I was art directing for a while for about seven, seven to 10 years. Uh -huh. Never really worked like full time for anybody. This was during a weird era where you can make a living just freelancing. Yeah. And I was a hardcore freelancer. I yeah. never had a resume. It was just all word of mouth. And one person called and said, hey, this person gave me your name. Can you come by tomorrow? And I would just go into a new ad firm because they needed somebody who could do whatever skill they needed. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Wow. So, yeah, that's my commercial. Uh, <laughs> well, let's talk about your art. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I guess my art started early on. I guess I'll, I'll just start. Uh, the slideshow. Um, sure, share the screen. Because it's time to share. Um, yeah. Yeah, so that's not it, is it? No, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> Where did it go? Is it this one? Yeah. Can you see that? Yes, we can see it. All right. Can you see me still or am I, I can see you. It's great. It's perfect. All right. It's working in. All right. It's working. It's working. So uh, I'm B-Boy B and B-Boy is the term for a break dancer. Uh, it's, it's like in hip hop, you had the four elements and, and you know, if, if you're a DJ, you're called DJ your name, right? Um, so this is kind of the same thing. If you're a breaker, uh, you know, you put the predecessor, the, the, the pre, pre name, B-boy, and then your name. Uh -huh. So as far as my knowledge, uh, I was the first one to do that, to put the word, the term B-boy in front of my name. Uh, my name is B. Everybody calls me B. And so I put B-boy in front of it. So it's B-boy B. So if I was a DJ, I would have been DJ B. Um, so that's where the, my name comes from, um, from hip hop. And I got into hip hop pretty, pretty early on. And yeah, so I'll just go uh, down. So I'm a pretty well-rounded artist as far as art is concerned. But I grew up in Logan Square. I do graffiti and art. and I guess I've been called a pioneer writer enough to put it down on paper now, digital paper. Uh, I started out breakdancing and then I got into um, graffiti, modern day graffiti. Um, so I'm a break breaker and a b-boy. Um, so I do paintings, large and small. And my uh, career also took me to doing photography and video and also into uh, journalism, uh, mainly hip hop. So, so my approach to life is just to live and let live unless there's an injustice and then you have to act to correct. So that's kind of what my graffiti kind of lends itself to. So I've been doing graffiti since I noticed that there was differences in types of fonts and alphabets. So I grew up Mexican and my alphabet, the first one I learned was a letter off. It had an extra letter than the one I was learning in school. So I was like, what is going on? Um, so the, the Spanish alphabet has 27 letters and the, you know, uh, the American uh, is 26. So that's what got me kind of like questioning uh, typography. So that got me interested. Um, 
among other things. Um, and then my culture, uh, and like most kids do art and dance, um, as dance was part of my culture. Um, so I, you know, I took the dancing pretty quickly. And I grew up in the 70s and 80s and the 90s when kids used to go outside to play before video games became a household item. So if I wanted to play video game um, in, let's say, in the, in the 80s, I'd have to go outside to play video game, put a quarter in the machine and play video game somewhere outside of my home usually at a small restaurant or hot dog stand ahead, a pinball machine or some kind of, um, you know, a, a game that was, you know, I mean, today's stand is pretty rude, rudimentary and very basic, but, you know, stuff like asteroids and things like, uh, you know, Galaga and, you know. Uh, going to arcades. Games. Yeah, going to arcades. And then later became... Somebody uh, decided to open up arcades. Um, so we did a lot of outdoor activities in, the, in this era before the you know, computing came to your um, desktop. Um, so what languages can you learn to communicate with the whole wild, wide world? Who, who can answer that? I'll just answer it. It's just one language, it's art. Art can be dance, it can be music, and it can be visual. So you don't even need to speak a particular language to communicate with this, these types of art. So that's kind of what drew me more into art is that I could make, I used to doodle without words and make people laugh, right? In grade school, I used to doodle inside my books and you know, draw a rude, cartoon of the teacher or whatever, picking her nose, and people would laugh, and I didn't have to spell anything. Um, so that's, that's pretty much it. So then uh, my quick history is uh, I created Artistic Bombing Crew in 1982, uh, ABC, which is Artistic Bombing Crew. We hung out at the Eagle, and that became the writer's bench. In hip hop, this is two big, uh, you know, uh, accolades, I guess. And then Breaker Ray and I started a, a Zulu Nation chapter in 1990, which is also a big notch in hip hop's belt in Chicago. Um, when Zulu Nation started in New York, made its way here through Breaker Ray mostly, and I helped them start that. And then I was also a founder of the Fly Paper. In 1991, Flypaper is, was the only underground newspaper that had Chicago themed art uh, and articles based only on Chicago artists. So we covered all the artists that were not covered by the uh, big magazines like The Source, uh, and the rap sheet, none of those ever covered any hip hop artists coming out of Chicago. So I also started a, a nonprofit called Renegades of Funk, which is kind of like a, a, the next evolution of, of Zulu. Um, we just wanted to get away from the Zulu politics and that's what Renegades of Funk was. And I've been doing graffiti for over 40 years, that's right. So really quickly, my professional uh, photography, this is kind of how I made my money in the uh, 90s and the 2000s is uh, doing photography. So this is kind of some of my work. This is like Burning Man. Uh, there's some concerts. You guys kind of recognize these guys, um, you know, Flavor Flav. And uh, what's his name? Uh, Zach from Rage Against the Machine. and you guys know her, Zoe. Uh, this, uh, this is kind of, a, these are all kind of Chicago-based concert. This is Lollapalooza. If you guys are my age, you know who that uh, woman on the right is. I think it's Cynthia. Um, here's some hip hop artists I photographed. Um, you know, pretty big names. 
only one from Chicago, sadly. Um, so my uh, designer uh, profession, uh, this is gonna be really quick too. So I did a lot of work for newspapers, which kind of stemmed from the flypaper. Um, so I kind of knew how to run a flypaper, a newspaper independently. And it got me into uh, the magazine and, and the newspaper realm. And this first one that says cafe, it says Yo Soy. Basically, it's, um, it's a magazine that was started to compete with People in Espanol, the Spanish version of People magazine. So we were around for three years. This one, Yo Soy issue, uh, which is kind of my idea. Uh, in Spanish, it, it has a double connotation. It means I am, but it's also the green issue. So that's what the soy is, the soybeans, soy products. And basically, the next page, the whole issue was printed on recycled paper. So there's a lot of things that I thought of that, you know, that went into this. But anyway, long story short, uh, Cafe Magazine, I was the art director. We won second place between, I don't know who was first. It was either Time or Newsweek, first place. Second place was Cafe Magazine, which is our magazine. I was one of the partners. And then third place was either Time or Newsweek. So uh, pretty quickly, we, we catapulted to the top, but we had some financial problems and the magazine only folded, it folded up about three years later. Um, and I worked at different newspapers across the city and I did a lot of photography work. Um, the one, the yellow one with all the t-shirts, all the shirts, the soccer shirts, I went to a store and I bought about a thousand dollars worth of shirts, and I shaped them in the in the shape of Africa, and I photographed <laughs> them. Thank you. I photographed them, and then I had to make sure that I quickly returned them because we didn't have a budget for that. Um, but that that was a cover. Um, it was a uh, you know the World Cup, and these were the teams in it, and the World Cup was happening in Africa. So that's what that cover is about. Um, so I did the photography for that. I did the soy photography. I did the natural beauty photography. I did not do the Baghdad tank looking at you photography, but I did the design work. I did the design work on, on all, all of these and then the photography work on all of them except Baghdad. So all of those are my photographs. And I worked for the Red Eye, and you can see I had influence with the Red Eye because I brought in graffiti, I brought in rap, um, gaming. So there's, there's a lot of influence that I brought along to uh, corporate world. Um, so here's some of my other photography. People don't normally see this, but I'm a professional photographer. I did some cool things like the first image on the top uh, left is it looks like the guy on the left is floating. Uh, I just asked him to like jump up, but pretend he's still on the floor, uh, standing still. So it looks like he's floating so to make it look like it's a haunted kind of photograph. And then the same thing with the guy next to him. I told him, please lean as much as you can. I'll take the picture when you're about to step. And we took a series of photographs but I got him leaning. So I did, I do a lot of stuff like that. Um, the girl wearing a rug as a shirt, uh, and some nice, uh, you know, dog photography, pet photography. I did some fashion stuff on the bottom. Um, there's a guy you might recognize, Diego Luna on the bottom corner. So yeah, I've, I've done a lot of photography. Um, and this is what we're all here for my unpaid passion for graffiti. <laughs> so let's first define graffiti. Uh, Dictionary.com says graffiti is writing or drawing scribbled, scratched, or sprayed illicitly on a wall or other surfaces in public place. 
So the key word there is illicitly. Um, so I guess the question is, when does graffiti become art? So I've had this debate throughout the years and I'll bring it to you guys here. Graffiti is art, there's no question about that. So is this art? Yes, it's done with spray paint, it's definitely art. So is this, is this art? Yeah, this is pretty much art because you can see their skill here, right? This one too, very realistic, looks like the wall broke through. How about this? Is this art? I don't know if you have anybody in the room, but they could yell out yes or no, but this could be an argument. And I'm not just talking about what's on the wall, but also on the poles, you can see there's sticker art as well. Um, so is this art? This is kind of like, it, this is where the debate starts to happen. These are just tags and people kind of thought like this and they don't consider this a skill. But this couple does. This is a newlywed couple and they stood in front of a tagged wall, it's just tags, the same styles. And they took their photograph of their wedding here. So in the 70s and 80s, graffiti definitely was questionable. But the progression of graffiti is tagging. It starts with tags, hand styles, right? And this is what people say, well, this is an art. But the reality is this does take some skill to come up with your own font and to do it over and over again to where people recognize that font. So you you created a, a brand new font, it's yours. So to me, it's very, very artistic. Um, the next phase uh, quickly of graffiti is throw ups. Throw up is basically mostly your name and it's big and it's done fast. So it's done quickly because you don't wanna get caught and it's, that word illicit, it's illegal. Um, it's mostly done in public so people can see it. And here it is, some, some throwies on a highway. And there's all kinds of throwies examples. So pieces. Pieces takes time and skill. So I don't know if nobody in the uh, audience there is, what is pieces short for? Anybody? No, nobody. Okay. It's uh, short for masterpiece. So that's a graffiti term. Pieces I didn't know. I didn't know that. Oh, well, there you go. That's, yay. Somebody learned. <laughs> Learning has occurred. So that's what pieces is short for. It's masterpiece. So this is somebody's masterpiece. It's three dimensional. It's colorful. It's big. Obviously, it took some time. There's a skill level of reflection, shadows. And obviously, you know, your hand style to a different degree where it becomes three-dimensional, all right? So productions basically are the next step over pieces, burners and crew production. So this is a burner. It's got <coughs> all the elements and that wall is covered top to bottom, left to right with paint. So there's no spot that hasn't been painted. That's a production. It's got a full background, it's got characters, and it's got typography. And most of the time it has a message, sometimes. So this is not graffiti art. And this is where in Chicago, there was a huge, huge debate when I was coming up because this is how I learned. I learned off of these letters it's old English letters and they're very stylized. They do take some effort to, to, to do. And so this does take an artistic hand, but the reason people don't find this to be art is because it's related to gangs. All of these are gang tags, but you can see there, there, there's some skill to copy uh, an old English font. Um, so like I said earlier, all kids are artists, all kids are writers from the very beginning. And if you're coached or appreciated early on, you will definitely grow up to be an artist. Um, so graffiti art is 
a practice skill. It takes thousands of hours to master. So this guy has some really nice three-dimensional stuff. He's got some glows going on. He's got shadows. He's got highlights. And it almost looks like it comes off the wall. So, and then goes, we'll go take it back to uh, this may or may not be me in this photograph. Um, I'll give you a hint. I'm the one wearing a hoodie. But, oh, wait, everybody's wearing a hoodie. So that's as far as you'll get. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so this is, uh, you know, early, early ABC, early graffiti. Um, I don't want to name any names in here for certain reasons. Maybe it's statute of limitations. This is 30 years ago, possibly. How many years ago, Mr. Take was this? <laughs> Uh, probably 84 or 85. I can't. I'm it was it was New Year's Eve, 1984. Okay. New Year's Eve, we went out when everybody was celebrating. And uh, we had the bright idea that since everybody's celebrating, no one's going to be working at the station. So that's what happened. Um, this is one of my early, early pieces. It's colorful. This was done. I just learned that it was on top of a um, uh, like an army place, an army facility, a uh, an armory, armory, an armory. Yeah. So this was pretty bad. If we would have got caught for this, I never went back to finish. You can see that I started doing the shadow and some some uh, 3D work on this piece. But I, I something happened, and the person I was with painted the the other wall. You can't see it. Um, and I hadn't seen this photograph for years. I just recently came, it came to me, um, which is cool. And, and very little people didn't know who this, who this was because I never finished it, I never signed it. I really didn't sign my pieces too much. But if you look closely, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but you can see the B-boy B right in the letter D. It's B. I don't know if you can see my cursor or not, but. I pointed it out. It's on the first letter on the bottom. It says B-Boy-B. Um, and then this takes us to kind of, I'm going to skip several eras of stuff where I did flypaper and all kinds of other stuff. Um, this was the first production at Project Logan. So I did the uh, typography. I did the Logan Square, and I helped out with some of the background and some of the colors. Uh, I this, love that production and I love that that whole set of artists that time. Oh yeah, yeah. So this there was a mostly ABC artist did this. Risk was involved, Flash, and I forgot who else uh, helped. Um, somebody did the uh, the eagle. I forgot who it was. It might have been. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna name the wrong person because that's a Flash question. You have better memory than me. Um, and then most of these next slides are um, Project Logan, where, oh no, this is not Project Logan, sorry. This is a Christmas themed um, graffiti, and I call it graffiti still because it still has typography in it. If you guys can't tell, the Christmas tree is the letter A, the letter B, and the letter C. It's stacked on top of each other, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but this is the A. Here's the B. And the bottom is the C, bottom of the tree. So that's in a garage in Logan Square. Uh, this was meeting of styles. I'm kind of not picky. So I go to meeting of styles and wherever they want to throw me, I will paint. And they threw me really far away on the first wall. They're like, nobody wants to paint there. You paint there. And I said, yeah, I'm going to paint there. So I painted there, came out nice, pretty clean, simple, simple letters, simple colors. Um, here's another Logan Square piece. It's the ABC whale. It's spilling onto the garage, can of paint, ABC paint. Here's a 606, which I painstakingly worked on for several years to get the 606 to give 
artists, graffiti artists, a space to paint and to get paid and to get free paint. And, uh, and yes. Yeah. Yeah. So this was kind of like first of its kind. And yeah, we worked painstakingly with the city. Um, we had a bigger budget and um, it came down a lot, but I also overshot it and it came down more than what I wanted. So everybody was happy. Um, here's some ads uh, I painted for a restaurant that's now gone, also in Logan Square. Uh, Yushu. Uh, Frankie Knuckles passed away. We did a, a piece for him on top of a rooftop of the exit store on Fullerton and Sacramento. <clears throat> you have a time-lapse video of this, right? I do have a time-lapse video of this and some other, several other pieces that I did at, uh, uh, at other events, but this was time-lapse. Uh, but the weird thing about this is that the guy who owns the store downstairs called me to complain that people from all over the world were knocking on his door and wanting to get on the roof so they could take a picture on the Frankie Knuckles wall. He's like, people coming from Japan, they couldn't even speak English. They wanted a picture. And I let a few of them up, but it got too crazy. So I told them they couldn't go up there. Um, so that's the power of art. Some people don't realize if you have art on your business that it could be fruitful for your business. This is one of them, you know. Um, and then I've been doing Dead Eyes for like, I say 20 years. And they became really popular uh, with the, I guess, street art culture because they're very street arty. Um, so here's a Chicago Bears dead eye wearing his winter jacket and gloves holding the thing. Here's a, uh, you know, tequila dead eye cactus wearing his, this was kind of like a, um, I think I did this for Cinco de Mayo. Pretty racist of me, but it's okay because I'm Mexican. But I do like the tequila bottle. There's a dead eye on it as well. Um, here's what I did for Halloween. This guy is pretty big. I think it's like, I don't know, 12 or 15 feet tall. It's Project Logan. You can see the ladders there. Um, this is a piece that I did, the dead eye. And then the ABC take two piece in the photograph with the, uh, <clears throat> with the Band-Aid. That, that was my partner, take two. He did the piece, the background, and then I did the, uh, the dead eye. Uh, kind of taking a picture, and that's that's the picture he took. So it's kind of like a throwback to when the first ABC piece that Take Two did, well, not the first piece that he did, but one of the pieces that he did in 85, we brought it back through time, through a photograph, but all through paint and art, which is kind of cool. So you, we could paint whatever we want. So this is also Media Styles. I think it was last year, Media Styles last year. Um, this is a, another character with some cool colors. It's called Bomber Boy. Um, here's some very, very bright colors. I came into this um, and I asked the two artists that were there, um, what's his name, not Tracy, who does the... Uh, Mario. 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 Yeah. Yeah. And I asked them if I could paint and they were... To my surprise, they were like, oh my God, it'd be an honor. I'm like, okay. So I made mine without color, just to balance out what was going on on this, on this garage. Um, he so, was really, really excited. <laughs> yeah, which is, I'm still humbled, man. I really am. Um, so yeah, he, he let me on. And like I said, I work well with different artists and I could vibe. So I went through Mario's skull, through his nose, behind the skull, behind the brain. And I went through the frog's ear and came out the other side of the ear with the tentacle and around the tongue. So this is kind of like a, a collab piece. 
and there's a lot of collaboration. I, I did a lot of collaboration with ABC and that's kind of where I learned from. Just like, you know, dealing with people who are like, I'm gonna paint this. And then I'm like, okay, I'll, I'll paint with you and around you and make it work. So um, this is the Congress Theater. We started this last year, it's called Project Congress. Um, it's my skull that I did. And then I started venturing out to doing other things. The Korok is a video game character and you lift a rock and he pops out and he gives you these golden seeds. So he says, ha ha, you found me. So, I, so people who know that character and play video games know exactly what that is. So, so Cong Project Congress, you're organizing all the artists on there and like making sure people get on there and you change, yes. it, and you change it up right now as they're like having the board mm. outside. Yeah, so Project Congress is very similar to Project Logan, but the rotation is a lot less because I don't want to do that much work. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> but um, yeah, uh, at Project Congress, I try to rotate it like three or four times a year, so every three or four months. So the next one's coming up in... in uh, in the springtime in, in uh, actually in a couple of weeks in April. Um, There's some so, beautiful murals that have been on there. It's, a, it's yeah. if you want to check it out, it's on Milwaukee. It's on the Congress theater between Western and California yeah. centered between them. Yeah. It's Rockwell and, and Milwaukee. So that's where it, the corners are. Um, so yeah, this was uh, these, this is my uh, pieces on, on the Congress wall. Um, this is another, cactus that was pretty tall at Project Logan. Uh, this is a uh, hate rest in peace piece. Um, and the character is a chase of this other person who, who passed away, another graffiti writer named Chase. This is his character style. I mimicked it and uh, put it up in honor of both of those uh, deceased writers. Um, so this is also on Project uh, Logan, um, yeah, so, and then here's some, I guess, uh, um, you know, um, art on canvas, which I rarely do, and um, I started doing it more because people are interested in buying pieces. Um, here's a piece I did at last year's um, State Street, because of COVID, they kind of were like wanting to have people come and celebrate on State Street. This is one of my contributions. And then more art. I think Flash ended up with this one. And then here's one I just recently did over the winter. It's a big panel piece, it's the letter B. So it's a study of the letter B. So, and then here's another piece that I sold People like the dead eyes, so I will continue to do them. Uh, this is way up north. I think this is on Belmont. Yeah, this is on Belmont. Um, the little uh, octopus, another octopus. I guess I like, I like octopus. And then here's a kind of like, a, I wanted to make a soft letter B. I kind of made it look like a weird rocket ship, but it's, Disguises the letter B. If you see, if you run the shape around the edges of the piece, it forms the letter B. Um, so it's a letter B in disguise as a soft, cushiony spaceship. Um, here's another dead eye. This is from 2013 at Meeting of Styles. And this was recently, did this last year, the Grinch dead eye. And then doing some computer illustration, testing out new iPad. And then, oh, this guy, we saw him already. And then this is the, uh, just pencil sketches. So you can see that I, I do start out on paper. And this is the horny dead eye. He plucked his horn off and put it on a stick. So that's, that's pretty much it. Um, thank you for watching. I guess I should have put my Instagram up here at some point, but I'll yeah, put maybe. it on. Yeah. 
you could put it on, I would greatly appreciate it. And then I guess I'm, I'll be open for Q and A. So, oh, I, sh I should have been looking at the chat. Ah, yes, yes, indeed. I'm kind of interested in some of your in-between phase. Like mm -hmm. I know what you've been doing in the last 10 years, cause you know, and I know I met you probably in the nineties in one of these kind of spaces in Logan Square or Wicker Park or around. Um, I know that, you know, you probably organize like parties and different events as well. Like, did, yeah. and you were, and because like, you're also an organizer, like you organize Project Logan sometimes and you organize Project Congress and you organize different walls. I mean, I kind of want to like understand you as an organizer and what that means to you and why you do it. Sure. Um, so I guess I got introduced to organizing uh, when I was at Columbia College. I had a professor who taught Latino studies at Columbia College, and he he like hooked me and reeled me in because I was like, oh man, I'm interested. Um, so I learned a lot from this class. Uh, about, you know, uh, uh, Latin culture that I didn't know about. Um, and then I helped him and his organization on Division Street for many, many years. Um, I did, I was doing the flypaper at the same time, but I did do a p political magazine for the Puerto Rican organization on Division Street. Oh, great. Yeah. Um, so I, I did a lot of uh, bus tours to uh, Washington with them, uh, you know, watching movies like A Day Without a Mexican and other revolutionary films, you know, documentaries. Um, but I also learned a lot from that group as far as the law is concerned, like things that... Do you, you know, work with the Puerto Rican Cultural Center? I did work with the Puerto Rican Cultural yeah. Center. Um, Yes, and I worked, I taught at their school, which used to be on North Avenue and Bell. Some of my friends taught at that school too. I taught a, um, a history class, a, a hip hop history class, and the kids loved it. All these kids that I was teaching, they all got kicked out of the roughest school in the city, uh, Clemeni. They got kicked out of Clemeni and they ended up here, um, you know, and they were young kids, but they were just restless and, you know, they went to game banging and blah, 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 you know, the whole, the whole nine. But uh, for some reason, I kept their attention um, and, you know, I ended up teaching a bunch of kids during that era. Um, I used to have to sleep at the center because every time uh, no one was in the center, the FBI would go in and bug it but they wouldn't go in and bug it if someone was in there. So wow. We always had somebody in the place at all times. We so the, the time sleeping there. And you taught at the Pedro Albizo Campo school. I did before it's actual implementation of an actual school. Okay. Yeah. This was maybe 10 years before that school was built, but I knew that was their goal. And it was great to see awesome. that actually come to fruition. It's on Division of California. It's awesome. But yeah, so that was kind of like one of the, you know, the predecessors of that school. Um, so yeah, that's my, where I learned to associate and uh, navigate uh, organizing. Um, and I just learned that it doesn't have to be political, but in this instance, it was political. Um, I was in my 20s, so it had to be political. For a 20 year old to make sense of it, you know, like, oh, yeah, fight the power. Um, so, yeah, that was my introduction to organizing. So, I helped them a lot. And then I organized also with uh, Break Array uh, to keep breakdancing alive and well in the city when no one else was doing breakdancing events. Uh, break Array and I would do breakdancing events. So, we did all kinds of breaking events. We had all kinds of names <clears throat> and we did all kinds of battles. So I think he and I single-handedly kept 
breakdancing events alive during the early 90s when breakdancing kind of disappeared from the space of the earth. And um, I, I even think, uh, I think they take two went to New York to go battle somebody during this time. And he found out the hard way that it didn't exist anymore in New York. Yeah, that was like even like just before that, like in the later 80s when breaking was still big here, there was nobody doing it there. I expected yeah. to be like battling on every corner like we used to battle here and there was there was nothing. Um, B, I, I'd be interested in you talking like more about your early organization. So, you know, Chicago was so segregated back then and we all stayed in our neighborhood. Yet you came and recruited me and I, you know, I lived much further northwest and you were recruiting guys from all over the city. What what kind of spark? What do you say? Like, what was the spark to do that? Because there was no there was no um, like playbook or blueprint for doing that. <clears throat> yeah, that was that that was very odd of me to do as a as a child. I guess as a child. Um, the uh, I think the driving factor of me going outside of my neighborhood, out, not 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 just like Logan Square, but because even, even Logan Square, there was parts of Logan Square in the 80s that I couldn't even go into, which was just, you know, 10 blocks over. I couldn't go over there because there was Latin Kings there. Um, you know, I couldn't go, you know, further east because there was another gang there, but it was all still Logan Square. And I think that that was a driving force because, man, I was always kind of rebellious. I, I never liked to be told what to do. So, you know, my mom said, you better come home at six because you got to eat dinner. So then, of course, I wouldn't come home because I, whatever. So I think that was the rebelliousness in me that drove me outside of my neighborhood because the guys in there that were telling me, be D or be dead, you're telling me that if I'm not a D, I'm going to die. No, I'm going to show you. I'm going to bring my, bring up my own crew, and they're all going to walk through here, and you're not even going to notice. Um, I think that was kind of like a, a small click in the distance in my brain, like, ah, I, I, I can't just, you know, recruit from my own neighborhood because that goes against my principles uh, of it, it'll just be another gang because that's what gangs are. There. It's a crew of your own you know, people that you know on your own block. So I, I wanted something different. So that kind of, um, you know, as, as a, as a preteen, as a teen, we started traveling and I had friends who kind of got in trouble and they got moved to a different neighborhood, but I still friends with them. So this particular friend, his name was Tony. He went to a hot dog stand and he came by the next day, he goes, man, you got to go to this hot dog stand. There's this guy, he's working, he's got graffiti on his shirt. And I'm like, what? This is my friend, Tony. And uh, I'm like, okay, so like legitimately, I, like he and I went, he took me to this hot dog stand and I went to meet Take Two. And, uh, you know, like, hey, you guys got to come by, you know, come by the Eagle and you know, meet, meet the ABC crew and you do graffiti, we do graffiti, we get along. Um, so in that instance, that organizing, I already knew that he may have trouble because he, he looked like a white kid, even though he, he, he isn't 100% white, but he did look like a white kid. Uh, I think you were in Gaylord neighborhood maybe, or Royals, he was a kid. So not only did he look like a white kid, but Back then, I can take a look at three different people and tell you what neighborhood they're from or who they're associated with. Like, that's how sensitive, like, our eyes understood the gang culture. Like, I could tell that kid was a Latin king from North Avenue um, or this kid was a gangster from West Logan um, or that white guy is a gay lord or a royal, I can tell them apart. So I had to organize 
for take two to come. And so the, my, my friends who were Latin disciples wouldn't jump them. So I would like, I go over to the park and like, hey man, I got some friends coming over. He's not a gangbanger, but he lives over there in Gaylord. Oh, don't worry about it, B, it's all good. So that's all it took. It didn't take much, but you know, these were my peers I, as well. Um, so I had to do that with, you know, take two. I had to do that with Trickster, who was a black kid from the West Side who, you know, kind of would be associated with like vice lords. So yeah, there's that type of organizing that was kind of instilled in me from early, early on, I guess. Um, so yeah, I did, I, I guess I've always kind of been on a different wave. Um, you know, there's different people. Uh, ABC had all kinds. We had crazy, crazy cats. Like scene was just crazy. Um, you know, we had uh, uh, people in our crew that weren't even artists, but they were part of the crew because they would, they could whistle loud and like, and, you know, and, and watch out for us while we're on a rooftop. Um, you know, like Scorpio, he didn't have any artistic ability, but he was still down with ABC. Um, plus he was a little older than us and he could fight a game banger. So, um, <laughs> or at least talk his way out of it or, you know, kind of like calm them down. Um, yeah, no. And I think that was kind of, you know, unique because you would like uh, ABC was a very multi-ethnic crew and like, you know, the gangs were pretty like, you know, if you're, yeah. there's a reason why they're the Latin disciples, right? And so, um, you know, being able to bring in, you know, people from the West side who are black, people yeah. from this neighborhood that are Puerto Rican, these people are Mexican, these people are white. Um, you know, representing all these different races. We had different genders. We had lots of uh, uh, young ladies in ABC. And so, you know, that was like, it was, it was very attractive, uh, someone coming in, being stuck in their neighborhood and being able to join in another dy really dynamic group. And that was a very unique thing um, that I saw that B-Boy B was uh, starting and then promoting other crews to do the same uh, early on so just wanted to say thank you for that yeah uh, thank thank you um yeah we were uh, you know all kinds of levels and all kinds of races and all kinds of genders um you know um you know uh i i knew we had you know some kids that were uh, gay it didn't matter to me mm -hmm. um it was during an era where I knew they were gay. I can tell they were gay, but they would never come out as gay during that time. But, you know, we all kind of know. And it was fine. Like, I didn't care. Um, you know, as long as they, they, you know, they helped out ABC. Um, but yeah, no, uh, yeah, thank you for that. Um, I appreciate, I never really thought about it in that aspect. But yeah, in hindsight, sure. I was a, uh, Stupid little kid, slightly organizing. <laughs> Uniting people. Yeah, o only out of uh, fear. Yeah, out of fear. Yeah. So didn't want to step on the gang's toes uh, back in the day. Things are not like that anymore, which is a good thing. Um, but, you know, also kids are not outside anymore either, no. um, which is, you know, a different thing. But into each, uh, you know, uh, to each their own, each generation has their own thing. So, but yeah, that's, yeah. So I, I did organize, I organized at Columbia College when I was at school. Um, I organized a ton, a ton of parties, uh, mostly for the same reasons like ABC because no one else would do it for us. So the, no one else, no one wanted break dancers at, at their bar at their party, unless it was specifically like, it's a battle for something and they were in it to make money. We were just in it to like to battle and to, to hone in our, you know, our skills. Uh, but yeah, they, they, didn't, they didn't like us if it wasn't specifically for, for the, you know, for the uh, event. So yeah, that, that was pretty much, uh, yeah, 
why I did what I did. And, and, and Breaker Ray was also a big advocate for that. Um, you know, and like, like Take Two said, he went to New York in, in late 80s and no one was breakdancing. And it was pretty much the height of breakdancing here in Chicago. And then after that, it kind of slowly started disappearing. Uh, but, you know, Breaker Ray and I kept doing those battles. Um, and then, as you know, as we grew older, we started doing, you know, bigger and better battles and then giving away money sometimes, you know, and prizes and things of that nature. Um, talking to Red Bull BC1, and uh, I was at the table for, for a couple of years with them, just like the 606. I, I was at their table. And weirdly, I met Red Bull because Red Bull owns a soccer team. And Cafe Magazine is Latino and they love soccer. So I met the head of the Red Bull uh, soccer program. And I asked him about BC1, which was kind of traveling around at the time. And he goes, what? What do you know about breakdancing? I'm like, eh, well, you know, uh, you can make an appointment with this cat. I know his name is B-Boy B. Um, but I, I slowly ended up talking to him and I convinced him that BC1, the battle BC1 needs to be in Chicago, specifically at the Aragon. I told him it has to be at the Aragon because it was a big battle, New York versus Chicago that never happened because the game bangers destroyed the place before the battle, just as the battle started. So anyway, long story short, a couple of years later, the Red Bull BC1, which is a huge event in breakdancing, came to Chicago. And I even got Breaker Ray to host it and ended up staying in Chicago for several years. Um, but yeah, so I guess I've always done things like that. I'm like, hey, that should be here. Let me, let me go find somebody that can maybe help me do this. Um, so yeah, that's kind of my you know, or organizing for always fighting for things that I think are not fair. Yeah. <laughs> yep. That's awesome. Yes. This is why I, we have <clears throat> much in common. <laughs> yes. Rebel Rousers. I think I met you. I was, the I was doing, all, I was also doing a lot of organizing in the 90s. Later take. Bye take. I, um, I, uh, I think this is a good point like to wrap up, but I actually, it's been so good to hear you talk about the organizing part and how you brought people together and you, you know, in this, in this particular way that was about like from all over the city, which wasn't going on at that time. Everyone was really separate. So thank you for that. And thank, thank you. you for sharing that because people should know these things. It's history. It's actually history. We need to know the history, and uh, and thank you for flypaper. Thank you for all the things that you've been doing all along, like organizing Project Congress. You keep on over and over again, and this is one of the reasons why you know Any Squared works so much with Renegades of Funk and all of you guys is because you always are thinking about opportunities for artists and how to help artists get out there and give people a platform to make art and get up out on the walls across the city. Yeah, yeah. So thank, thank you. you for that. And thank you for the talk. Yeah. It was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I really appreciate it after you <clears throat> are, are recovering from COVID. I'm so sorry you had COVID. That's fine. It's just two days worth. I'm oh man, up, I'm on the oh, upswing now. you're on the upswing. Yeah. Good, good. I hope you're good. Yeah. And I appreciate you doing this talk. We're going to share it um, in different ways in the next week. And, um, and uh, I appreciate you coming and sharing with Any Squared. Sure. I appreciate you guys putting me out there. Yeah. Thank Thanks. you so much.
Check social media for future Zooms and future streams.